Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel of First Presbyterian Church of Sterling, Illinois. This is our service for the 15th of May, 2022, and we're so glad that you've come to join us in this place. Whether you are far from here or near to us, we want you to know that you are welcome, both in this virtual space and in our actual physical space at 410 Second Avenue in Sterling, Illinois. We also want you to know that you are welcome to participate in the ministries we do. We are a place here of hospitality and inclusion. We um, offer all kinds of things for people in our community. This building is a place where many people come for various services. We have an LGBTQ drop-in center that's hosted here by Youth Outlook. We have an NA group. We have an AA group. We have Boy Scouts. We have Cub Scouts. We have a group of moms. And we have many other ministries that come from our church that may not be only our church. We are so active in our community and we always want to make space for others to participate in the things that we do and the things that we give in this in this area. So if you'd like to donate to our ministries, you can mail in your check to 410 Second Avenue, Sterling, Illinois, 61081. You can go to our website, firstpresbyterianstirling.org, and give there online, or you can drop by and come to worship and leave a donation with us and see other opportunities you might have to serve. And of course, we would welcome your prayers as support, your presence with us in spirit. We are so glad that you've come to join us. We want you to know that in this ministry, we remind you always that you are loved and you are worthy and you are enough. So thanks for being here. In this season, between Easter and Pentecost, which is the first Sunday of June, we've been doing a series as we look at the gospel lessons on setting intentions. Now, if you have done yoga or coaching or um, spiritual direction or other kinds of activities like that, you may know about setting intentions. It's really a simple kind of thing. It's a, it's a time of taking a moment to think about how you're going to show up in a particular moment or a particular space. We've been giving our members who come to worship these little cards in their order of worship for them to look at and to think about setting their own intentions as they go through the worship service and through the week. We'd be delighted to send these to you. Um, if you'd like to let us know your address, we'd, we'd love to share them with you so that you can set intentions. If you're not familiar with intentions, just a quick overview. Intentions are not like a goal where you're going to try to accomplish a certain thing but they're more like a, a way of being. Uh, you might use a word like, I'm going to come into this space in a hopeful way. I'm going to come into this space being open. I'm going to attend this event and try to be curious. There are lots of ways that you can set intentions. It might be a simple word, it might be a statement, but in this series, we are giving you some pointers and some poetry to help you set your intentions. So as you listen to this reading, think about your intentions. This theme this Sunday is about loving one another, the commandment Jesus gave us. So this is a poem called When This Is Over by Laurie Kelly Finucci. When this is over, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger, full shelves at a store, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, Friday night out, the taste of communion, a routine checkup, the school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring each deep breath, a boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, may we find that we have become more like the people we wanted to be, we were called to be, we hoped to be, and may we stay that way, better, 
for each other because of the worst. As we enter into this time of hearing the scripture and the sermons, I invite you to set intentions for yourself. How will you love others as Jesus commanded? How will you extend and share that love with others in your home, in your community, in the world around you? Take a moment and set your intention. For this fifth Sunday of Easter, we have two readings. One comes from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, and the other comes from the Gospel according, according to John. Acts of the Apostles is a history of the early church, the only history book in the New Testament. And of course, John's Gospel is one of the four Gospel stories, um, accounts of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Our first reading tells us about an important discussion between Peter and the other followers of Jesus early in the life of the church. Peter has reached out beyond their familiar community of Jewish believers and has baptized and welcomed a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, into the faith. The leaders in Jerusalem are understandably concerned. They are worried that their community may be threatened by the welcoming of outsiders who do not follow their practices. They truly believe that God has chosen them, and so it would logically follow that if they are chosen, then others are not. There's also a very reasonable concern among them that this fragile new community of believers is not ready to expand or reinterpret the gospel when they've barely begun to live out the full implications of it themselves. So this scene in Jerusalem foreshadows the Jerusalem Council, which comes a few chapters on in the book of Acts, in which the leaders decide once and for all that all are welcome. Having been raised to believe that God revealed God's self in the Torah, and now they're coming to terms with the new reality that God has been revealed to them, in the person and work of Jesus Christ, they must reinterpret the message of Jesus and their participation in it. Let's listen for God's word to us in Acts 11, 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the brothers and sisters who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. 
I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second voice, a second time, the voice answered from heaven. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house, saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who's called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The gospel reading for today, as I mentioned, comes from the gospel according to John. It's a part of the text normally used on Maundy Thursday. That's the Thursday of Holy Week when we remember that Jesus gathered with his friends on the night that he was arrested. And they, as they gathered, Jesus took on the role of a servant and washed their feet. They shared a meal, the Last Supper, and then Jesus broke the bread and poured the cup, enacting what would later we would imitate as the Lord's Supper. And Jesus gave them a new commandment, love one another. It's worth considering that perhaps Peter remembered not only the meal, but also this commandment to love when he had that encounter with the Gentile that you heard about in Acts. Let's listen for God's word to us in John 13, verses 31 to 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am only with you a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to others, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's finally almost summertime, and a lot of us are thinking about traveling. I know I am. I love road trips. Sometimes when I'm on the road, I listen to audiobooks. It makes the trip go faster for me. And sometimes I listen to lectures, like academic lectures, like professors, lectures about theology or literature or history or the Bible, as you might guess. I know, like Siri, navigate me to nerdy nerdsville. Y'all normal people are driving down the road, listening to the radio, singing along, we're breaking the law, we're breaking the law, we're breaking the law. And I'm listening to a series of lectures on St. Augustine. Not the city in Florida, but the theologian, St. Augustine of Hippo. He was born in 354, and he wrote these profoundly influential books and treatises which probably influenced Christian belief more than anyone other than the Apostle Paul. He was a heretic until he was baptized in the year 387 at the age of 33. I've been thinking about St. Augustine in the last few weeks in light of some of the events taking place with our Supreme Court. 
As weird as it may seem, I'm also thinking about the story you heard from the book of Acts and the gospel lesson and how all of these tie together. So let's start with the Supremes, the Supreme Court of the United States of America. The nine justices of the court are charged with interpreting the laws according to the Constitution of the United States. The Congressional Research Services report has a piece that outlines the ways that our justices might interpret that document. The first one is called textualism. It pays attention to what is we call the plain meaning, and it seeks to find this objective meaning of the framers and um, their context, the time the document was written. The next way is called originalism, and several of the justices hew to this um, particular method. Originalism attends to what the words say, believing that the words have an objectively identifiable meaning that has not changed. Originalists believe they can reasonably reconstruct what that original meaning was. Another approach you've heard many times is precedent, what happened before. And still another is pragmatism, what's practical in real life. There's a approach called moral reasoning that relies on the belief that there are moral ideas that form the foundation of our Constitution. And those moral principles or ideals like due process or equal protection under the law should inform our interpretation of the document. And occasionally the justices will rely on ideas of national identity, the character of the nation to construe meaning. The last two are structuralism and history. Structuralism looks at the parts of how the structure work together, like the three branches of government. There's, you remember this from eighth grade civics, legislative, executive, and judicial, and how do those work together? And then what's the interrelationship between federal and state governments? The historical approach, kind of obvious, um, looks at what's been done in the past and how the Constitution's meaning has been understood in our nation's history. Now, there are many ways of understanding our Constitution, just as there are many ways of interpreting Scripture. And while none of us are Supreme Court justices, I don't think anybody of the Supreme Court is watching my YouTube videos, All of us who are thoughtful Christians can use all of these approaches whenever we interpret a document or a statement or the Bible. All of us use these various lenses when we're looking at making decisions or taking a position on a particular issue or social question. We often look for the plain meaning of a text or a story without paying too much attention to the context. Love one another. Who cares what the context was? Sometimes we're originalists. A day is a day. The meaning hasn't changed. We rely on precedent, what we've already decided, and pragmatism, what works, and moral reasoning. We believe that our brains are a gift from God, our minds are a gift from God. We don't use national identity too much as Christians, which is good because the Bible wasn't written for Americans. Structuralism, when we read the Bible, might ask us to reflect on how the Old and New Testaments fit together. And history is what we Christians call tradition. What have we always believed and taught? Now, since you're all normal people and not theology nerds, you may not spend a lot of time thinking about methods of interpretation, but you do interpret scripture all the time. And because you're not too nerdy, like me, you may not know that St. Augustine advocated a non-literal interpretation of scriptures. And in fact, he said outright, the creation story in Genesis is metaphorical. In his writing about science and scripture, back in the beginning of the fifth century, he said, it is too disgraceful and ruinous, though, and greatly to be avoided that he, the non-Christian, should hear a Christian speaking so idiotically on these matters. St. Augustine, church patriarch, a saint, the bishop of Hippo, did not take the Bible literally. In fact, he had one single rule for the interpretation of Scripture, 
an unbendable law in which he held above all others, the law of love. Augustine said that the best interpretation of the Bible is whatever encourages love of God and love of other people. That's it. That's his rule of exegesis, of understanding scripture. In fact, Augustine said, even if your interpretation is not what was intended by the original author, even if it's wrong, it follows the law of love, it's a good interpretation. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Even if it's inaccurate, the best interpretation is the one that follows the law of love. If you follow the law of love, you're right, even if you're wrong. The story you heard in Acts demonstrated this more than 300 years before St. Augustine came along. Peter came to Jerusalem to explain himself to the other leaders of a new church, this band of Jews who had just lately begun to be called Christians. They want to know what in the world he's up to, allowing Gentiles to be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit? Peter replies with this account of this strange vision, this big white cloth like a tablecloth coming down from heaven and spread out on the cloth were all sorts of foods, both clean and unclean. And Peter heard this voice telling him, eat. Now, Peter was a good Jewish guy. He knew that God said there are certain things you just don't eat. But the voice says what God has said made clean, you must not call profane. And then something happened that made Peter sure that this vision was not about food at all, but something more crucial. Because the next thing that happened was three men came to summon him to a house in Caesarea, and there the householders told of a vision of their own. You can read the detailed account in chapter 10 of the book of Acts. It's in the New Testament. And by the way, if you don't have a Bible and you'd like one, shoot us an email and we'll send you one. You can read about this whole story in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts. In this chapter, Peter has reduced the story to its most salient points. And at the end of the council gathering, the leadership agreed. The Gentiles of Antioch can be fellow believers and they can be baptized. Now, this may sound crazy to your 21st century ears, but this story has enormous consequences, consequences that Augustine foresaw, at least in part. This story demonstrates the great commandment in action, Augustine's law of love, Jesus' words in the gospel made real and embodied love one another. Augustine's test of interpretation is met. Does it encourage love of God and love of others? Yes. Yes, it does. All this is to point to an interpretation of Scripture and maybe to an interpretation of our laws and our Constitution that for Christians might involve many approaches, but ultimately ought to end with Augustine's test. You know, I can show you scriptures that say I shouldn't be standing here preaching because I'm a woman. In our own history, there were serious, faithful American Christians who put forward biblical arguments in favor of slavery. When the PCUSA General Assembly convened in Minneapolis in 2010, they had serious discussions about interpretation as it pertained to the ordination of LGBTQ ministers, elders, and deacons. Presbyterians practice freedom of conscience. So commissioners to our General Assembly and to our Synod and Presbytery and the elders on our session vote their conscience as they believe Christ leads them. They seek to listen to that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit that guides us to reflect the mind of Christ, the Lord of love. When that big white tablecloth came down from heaven in Peter's vision, the intention was not to change his appetite, but to change his attitude. The question was not what was on the table, but who was welcome at the table. Friends, understanding scripture is simpler than we might think if we follow the great commandment. Interpreting scripture 
becomes far less complicated when we follow Augustine's law of love. So maybe it's still a good way for us to interpret, I don't know, everything. Maybe this is the best test of any choice we make. Does it encourage love of God and love of others? Then it is so much easier to know how to obey Jesus' great commandment to love one another. Amen.